welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's program, The Hotter and Gayer Narrative in Ceramics with Matthew Lim. Uh, my name is Beth Ann Gerstein and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director of AMOCA and the co-curator of this exhibition. This exhibition is the second in our Making in Between series. The first one, Making in Between Contemporary Chinese American Ceramic Ceramics was in 2020 and was focused on six first and second generation Chinese American ceramic artists who explored themes of cultural heritage, identity, language, politics, migration, and displacement. Making Between Queer Clay shifts the lens from national heritage to broader influences on identity and centers queerness as an unapologetic presence. Queer Clay features work by historical artists alongside contemporary makers. Mounting an exhibition that focus, focuses slowly, solely on work by queer artists, Amoka brings less familiar narratives to the forefront of ceramics. Presented together for the first time, these works exemplify the compelling contributions of queer artists to the Western art canon. Before we begin the talk, I'd like to thank Matthew Lim, Alexis Salas, Richard May, Steve Conti, and Pam Aliaga for their important contributions to this exhibition and catalog. Our beautiful full-color catalog is available for purchase at the museum store and was designed by Raquel Hazel from Salt Press. You can also buy it online. We would love to also thank the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, the Dew Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Pasadena Art Alliance for their generous support of the exhibition and catalog. Also, friendly heads up, uh, this is being recorded and will be made available for, for Automoka's website shortly. If you haven't yet, please be sure to mute yourself so we can all hear the feature presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Pam Aliaga, whose pronouns are they, them. They will be leading the discussion today. Pam was the co-curator for Making In Between Queer Play and is also Amoka's amazing exhibition manager. Pam. Oh, thanks, Beth. Um, thank you so much. So I'm excited to start this conversation today. I've been looking forward to this program for some time now, and I'm excited to hear everything Matthew has to say. But I want to introduce Matthew, who goes by they, he, as his pronouns, our, um, our guest speaker today, and writer of our opening essay for Making Between Queer Clay Catalog. Um, Matthew Lim is an emerging scholar of 20th and 21st century of American craft and design based in the University of Arkansas. Their book project, Unearth Geological Primitism and Land Use in American Ceramics is a queer eco-critical critique of the ceramic artist Glenn Lucan, Hal Ryger, Wen Ng, and Rick Dillingham, their engagement with the landscape of the American West. His research has been supported by D the Douglas Foundation, Predoctoral, um, Predoctoral <laughs> Fellowship at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the American Council of Learned Societies, Henry Lutz Foundation and Dissertation Fellowship in American Art, the Center of Craft Research Grant and the Decorative Arts Trust Grant. I'm excited, let's pass it over to Matthew and he'll get started with his presentation today. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Pam and Beth. Um, it's great to be here today. I'm excited to be speaking to you from Arkansas. I very much miss California. Um, I recently finished my PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and, and this year I'm the art history fellow with the University of Arkansas at the School of Arts. Um, I've been asked to come to speak to you today a little bit about my own research um, and part of this wonderful exhibition that Amoka has put on on queer and clay, um, queer ceramic art and history. Um, I wanted to have this be largely a conversation discussion that we'll do, but I also wanted to bring in um, a couple artists that were adjacent to the larger exhibition that the museum put on that, and highlight some people from the Southern California region and up in San Francisco that very much, I think, speak to the larger conversation that this exhibition um, was about. And also speak a little bit about my own research and interests um, and how those kind of are a thread through the larger exhibition um, as well. So I'd like to kind of touch on um, some of, partially why I feel that ceramics history um, is so 
it, it's such a rich playground to explore um, queer art history and queer artists. And that is partially because the history itself is so full of people who identified as queer or were closeted and queer, and that at the time of their um, of their studio practice perhaps were not recognized, but still had a monumental impact on both queer history and um, American ceramics, especially in California. So this is a uh, photograph by the noted feminist photographer, Ann Brickman, um, taking a photograph of Glenn Lukens, uh, the Southern California ceramicist who founded the, the ceramics program at University of Southern California in 1933. Um, Glenn Lukens has been a, a key figure within my dissertation research and it, doing the, the kind of the behemoth as a dissertation has been very enlightening of how important the archive is to kind of recovering queer history and to understanding kind of the legacy that queer artists have left behind. Um, Glenn Lukens is someone that was not out uh, publicly within his lifetime. Um, his archive is chock full of very intimate um, relations, especially um, throughout the 1930s and 40s and 50s. He's in a series of interracial relationships in Southern California. So there's a kind of a, a double outing that's going on with Lukens, but he is one of the primary architects that sets the stage for Southern California's um, kind of ascendancy in the importance of this, this avant-garde movement of ceramics that's happening. Um, Lukens is a, a, a big patron of the Southern California black art scene, uh, especially um, around Hollywood. He's working with people like the dancer Janet Collins, the gallery owner Jenny LeJong. Um, but he's also doing very interesting work out in Death Valley and other um, parts of the Southwest and thinking through, I would argue, his queerness through a, a kind of queer expression through materials. Um, Lukens is specifically interested in certain minerals, um, specifically with alkalines, that often don't make the best glazes. They produce very drippy, kind of viscous um, glazes that he gets a lot of critique for um, when he shows these various pieces at, say, the, the Pan American exhibition in San Diego. Um, and he very much embraces this as, I think, part of his larger queer identity. Um, but Lukens is a figure who historically is very important within the history of American ceramics, but has very much fallen out of queer history. And I think part of the, the impetus of, of why we need to start doing more archival research and, and digging into the queer past is, is to recover these stories and these people. Um, another figure that I only recently discovered in the last year and came across is Manuel um, Jelinovich, who actually worked with George Orr. Um, he was trained by George Orr in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, he migrated up to New York City and or the New York area and started working at the Durant Kilns um, and met Ingvart Olsen, who became his life partner. And the two of them moved to San Francisco and opened um, Jelinovich and, and Olsen Pottery. And they also founded an art school that largely trained women ceramicists in the 1930s. And Vivica Haino was one of their students. So there's a, a, a very strong lineage between some of the largest mid-century um, ceramic studio potters um, going back to these little known um, queer couple that's working in the Bay Area at the time. Um, Olsen was migrated from Denmark. He was a porcelain technician that worked at the Royal Danish Copenhagen Kilns before he met Jelinovich. Um, there's not a whole lot of archival information available about these two. And that's something that as a researcher has been one of the biggest hurdles that so often within the archive, especially when we're working on queer histories and stories, that there's always holes in the archive. There's always information that doesn't get left behind, that it becomes more difficult to tell their stories um, and to recover this history. And we have to make, uh, think very creatively and very expansively to try to um, bring these individuals 
back and highlight them within the, the larger history of uh, queer ceramics. One of the areas within my own research that also plays a very nice role within the exhibition that I'm quite interested in is how American ceramics has played a role within the AIDS crisis. So the AIDS crisis is something that contemporary art has played a quite a large role in. Um, when, we, when, when I teach the AIDS crisis in my classes, or I've seen it taught before, it's often focuses around um, Grand Fury and other people who are using uh, mass media images, which were crucial at the time to spread awareness of what was going on with HIV and AIDS um, and build political support. But something that always bothered me or a question that I always kind of had about the AIDS crisis was why that history always focused so much on the visual image rather than a material object. So when we're dealing with something like AIDS, that is this moment that the that the body is in danger and that there that, that danger is is um, passed along through touch, that how do, do artistic mediums that deal with touch whether that be ceramics or fibers for something like the AIDS quilt, um, how, how can we understand um, how queer touch can, can navigate these moments through something like, this, like the ceramic medium? Um, so Rick Dillingham is a California artist who works quite a lot in the Southwest. Um, he's based in, Sa in Santa Fe for quite some time. Um, he dies from HIV AIDS in 1994. And this body of work I came across, this was actually the beginning of my dissertation research. So I came across this flyer that you see on the left um, advertising his The AIDS Series at the Linda Durham Gallery in Santa Fe in 2016 at the Elaine Levin Archives in the University of, at the University of Southern California. Um, and this was the last body of work that Dillingham created. There were only four pieces. I recently found out about five months ago that he also created a video component with these pieces that I'm very excited to see. It's going to be up um, at the, the New Mexico Museum of Art in a couple of months. Um, Dillingham will be having a retrospective. But AIDS is, fr from my view, something that is critically underrepresented within ceramics history, um, within the the, the exhibition, there's this wonderful piece by Mark Burns, Plague and Lavender, HIV from 2017, that makes such a good, from in my opinion, conversation piece with kind of the ideas that artists like Rick Dillingham is working through or other artists involved in other areas of craft, for example, the AIDS quilt. Um, but Mark Burns's piece to me strikes this really interesting kind of interplay between both the horror of what was happening, but also the kind of playfulness of this culture that is being impacted um, with the inclusion of the disco ball and uh, other elements within the piece that I think it, it's so important within kind of queer culture, this um, ability to, to retain humor and to have kind of this tongue in cheek that the world may be burning down, but it's still going to be a dance party in some way, shape, or form. That it's it, that no matter what, people are going to keep moving forward in a way that is true to their own identity and themselves, and to to find a way to be and move and move through the world. Um, yeah, I, I think that the the there's a, a very large opportunity for craft history to to speak to the history of AIDS and to kind of rethink that art historical canon and to expand it beyond what does it mean to bring in material objects into this, this history of th this very violent pandemic that devastated both the queer community and the larger art world at the time. Another area that I'm very interested in within ceramics, um, so Nikki Green has a piece within the show. This is a, a different piece that they created in 2016, Breaking Dishes at Jean Compton's. And in, in this piece, Green is thinking about queer history um, as well as the everyday practices and circulation of ceramics. So these are all tableware pieces that they were able to collect from various thrift shops in the Bay Area 
that references a specific event um, from August 1966, where a group of trans women and others were at the Gene Compton's cafeteria um, and were harassed by police and the owner and used ceramic tableware as riot tools to as a means of liberation to fight back against a oppressive the oppressive police force and this is a, a moment within trans history that um historian susan Stryker has written about that is not very well known at all but it's it it's this moment that happens on the west coast three years before stonewall that also like ceramics played a central role within that um that narrative and to to sort of think through this recovery uh, using ceramics as a as a way to recover this archive and to to honor these women and the the moment of liberation that they were engaged within i think is crucial as we think through how to construct queer history its role um at, and ways of telling stories both within and in opposition to the canon um, and ways that we can dismantle that and, and think through more complex ways of telling stories. Uh, there, there are several different ways that I have seen queer artists kind of bring it, an expression of their sexual identity to their work. Often it comes in, in the case of Green's work, thinking through queer history and the archive. One of the other ways that I am fascinated with, I'm a, a bit of a material nerd, um, I am very interested in the kind of minerals that, that ceramists use, but also very unusual and unique ways of using um, their material. So this is um, a body of work by Jeremy Brooks. Um, it's his not pot work, where he has spent a lot of research and time figuring out how to crochet and knit colored porcelain. So we have uh, these vessels that are clay, but they also mimic looking like textiles or an Afghan. And the kind of queer history within that, that kind of textile production of within a domestic sphere of taking all these different parts together, what, whatever you have left or around you and making something out of it, bringing something into being. Um, and I, I think that Brooks and Green and other artists are very much laying a solid foundation for both the recovery of queer history, but also for thinking through the, the, the queer present. And what does it mean to be queer in this contemporary moment when so much of the larger queer community is under attack politically, um, our ability to be seen and move through the world is in jeopardy. And I think that these stories are crucial to who we are as both humans and artists. Um, and it, they, they deserve a seat at the table when we think about the larger canon of both craft history and art history. And so much of, so much of art history, from my view, very much ignores ceramics or just craft in general, it always is kind of in the back seat to painting or sculpture. And it, it, for, to me, that's it's so unfortunate because there is such a rich history that ceramics offers that is able to get at the types of questions that painting and sculpture cannot, that it's able to tell a different kind of narrative that both challenges the canon, but also supplements it. Um, so yeah, I'm very, I'm very excited about this exhibition and the work that it's done. I'm excited to see what its afterlife and how the catalog circulates and the kind of impact that it will make. And to continue to see museums grapple with how do we tell more complex narratives that are different from what we've told before and highlight voices that so often are relegated to the background. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, we're going to go into Q&A just to kind of start this discussion. Um, feel free to write your question down in the chat and I can read it out loud for you. Um, or you can always do the raise hand emoji and ask the question personally yourself. But I can kick off for the first question that we have um, throughout 
queer history, um, I understand the community is always treated very lightly at some times, but like you were talking about Nikki Green's work, at times it's been much louder. And thankfully there has been some archives about it. Is there a particular movement and the LGBTQ community and like the history that you wish had more material? Um, that uh, the whole thing. <laughs> it, <laughs> but for for me, especially within ceramics, and granted, this is from from my research interest. I, I do wish that we had more material from the AIDS crisis, because one of the real problems with working on the history of, of AIDS is there there becomes a issue that it, it can too easily fall into the history of white gay men. And AIDS very much impacted a much broader community. Um, when we when we think about the history of AIDS within contemporary art, the moment that we kind of stop thinking about it critically is when it no longer is impacting uh, the most privileged group that's being impacted by it. Um, so like very elite white gay men, but we still have an AIDS pandemic within this country and globally. There are communities in the rural South that are deeply impacted. Um, communities of color that don't have access to the same kind of health care that you would find in urban centers or elsewhere. And I think it, it's crucial that we are able to develop both contemporary archives and recover past ones that show the full spectrum of what it means to be queer, that it is not relegated to, to whiteness or to, to men, that it is a rich tapestry, including women, trans people, non-binary people, people of color, indigenous, and to, to really celebrate that in its full spectrum. No, definitely. No, I, yeah, I don't think I've di like dived in as much into the AIDS crisis as you were talking about earlier, especially about the um, queer touch. And I've yeah. never thought of it as a material instead of like a visual because I'm very I'm very like aware with all the visuals that happened. Um, yeah, there, there's not a whole lot about queer touch and AIDS that's out there other than the AIDS quilt that each of the panels were purposely made to be roughly the size of a coffin. Um, there is kind of the, the tactile history within fiber that I think is, is fairly well developed within um, by art historians of how they've thought things through. But I, I think that ceramics has so much to offer within that history. Um, a, another thing that's kind of coming to mind within that, so the, the Watershed Shed Center for Ceramics in Maine, they did a program in the early 1990s um, bringing people who had HIV or AIDS out from New York and elsewhere to do different kind of programming, thinking through healing and ceramics. And there's a really long history of like therapeutic craft within the ceramic arts. And like that, that extends to a queer history. I don't know, I've, I think partially with the pandemic in 2020 and, and to the present, I've been thinking a lot about this, this earlier pandemic that has impacted my community. Um, and just how crucial it is to kind of understand that history so that we can understand our present and move forward in ways that are both healing and everyone is prepared in the best way that they can be to address the problems that are we're confronted with. No, definitely. Uh, and again, if anyone has a question, please feel free to add it to the chat. Um, but I'm actually kind of curious on how it started, but when did you feel like you started challenging the classic narrative with more of a queer lens in your work? Yeah, um, well, I guess I should give you a little bit of background. That's so I, I never meant to become an art historian ever. It was not, I don't think I even knew what an art historian was until I went to grad school. So I, I was a history major. I was a, I'm a first generation college student. And I very quickly realized that I did not want to teach high school history because I did not want to be tied to a state curriculum. So I wanted to teach college, but the, the kind of research that I was doing during my undergrad was very material driven and visual. Um, I folded a thousand paper crayons one summer and the origami paper, I was using very cheap origami paper, but it stained my hands. And I started to think a lot about the materiality of color 
and kind of that history. She's like, okay, I'll go get a master's degree in art history and visual culture. And then I kind of got sucked in, but I had not had the same kind of backgrounds within art history when I kind of arrived on the field and the people that were training me. And it, it was very jarring to kind of be, to, to come from this American history background because I was suddenly confronted by the, the very rigid hierarchies that are like embedded within our history, that so many of the classes I was sitting in often felt like they shouldn't be called art history, they should be called the history of painting. That it was, it, all of the kind of artwork that I'd grown up with, my mother's a filter, my father's a woodworker. It's like, well, where are all the other things? So I started to get really interested in craft at that time, but it wasn't until I started working on my PhD in 2015 that I, I had been very resistant to working on queer things. So I, I didn't want to work on my own reflection of my identity. I avoided working on the American West where I'm from. And that both of those things are exactly what I ended up working on in the end. Um, it felt very much like coming home, but also it, it, you, you write what you know, right? Like you, it, I, I returned to the things that were familiar. Um, but the, the project that, I'm currently working on, um, it really started in about 2016. So like very early into my PhD, but it, it changed rapidly. Um, initially the project was supposed to be around thinking through ceramics and AIDS. But when I went out to do research at the Ceramic Research Center, which is at Arizona State University run by um, Mary Beth Bukeson, it's a wonderful space. I highly recommend people get to know it. That's where the Studio Potter archives are based. Uh, Susan Peterson's papers and letters are also there. And it, it, it's such a rich resource that I feel like so many people within the wider clay community don't know as much about as, as they could or are, we're not utilizing it as much as a community as we could. Um, but when I got out to the CRC at Arizona State, I was not finding stuff about AIDS like I had hoped to find. Instead, I found all of these very weird articles and materials about potters running around in the desert trying to build solar powered kilns in the 1960s. And all of, all of these like experiments with minerals and as I dug deeper into it, it also turned out that all of these people who were doing it happened to be gay. And it was like, okay, well, this is really cool and also weird. Why are all of these gay men running around Death Valley? And like, what is it about going out to the desert that allows you to sort of find yourself and to, to experience this sort of uh, development of sexual identity? Um, but yeah, it, it, it became, <clears throat> Um, I, I don't know, like I've always kind of been focused through a queer lens since that moment in early in my PhD. Um, but then like I started my master's in 2013, I finished this past summer through with the PhD. And in that 10 year period that I was in grad school, I've seen a massive amount of social change in my lifetime. Um, my first semester at my master's program, I was in Southern Illinois and Michael Brown was murdered in St. Louis. I've seen the, the rise of Black Lives Matter, the, these kind of rapid changes that we've seen that have impacted the LGBTQ community. And I think as a scholar and as a historian, I have a, a duty to my community, but, and also to the larger public to, to tell these stories and to ensure that our history is told and that it is recovered and that it can move on or be, be available for the future. No, definitely. We were living through a lot of events, yeah. <laughs> um, especially just the new generations, I hope, don't have to live through so much. Um, but that actually does kind of feed into my next question, because I know throughout your research, um, you're kind of talking about a frontier that is not spoken about so much. I, I don't hear too much um, historians or researchers really talking about the queer narrative in ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering when you actually went out to um, academia, were there other experts that you were looking towards or do you feel like most of it just kind of relied on you? 
Um, that's a, it's a really good question. So there's uh, anybody's research is always building on top of other people, whether it's directly about ceramics or other types of ideas. Um, so where I did my PhD, I was extremely lucky to work with Dr. Jenny Sorkin, who has done <clears throat> quite a lot of work on ceramics, women, and community as collective action and community. Her first book, Life Form, um, was instrumental to my thinking, both about my own project, but also just kind of like how to be a scholar and a historian. I was very lucky to work with her on her second book project, Art in California. Um, and that is actually where my dissertation work began. <clears throat> um, there's an exhibition series that started at the Pasadena Art Museum called California Design that has an extremely interesting exhibition catalog. Um, Eudora Moore, who was the curator and um, architect of the catalogs and also of kind of perpetuating the idea of California craft to the rest of the country, took the objects from the museum exhibition and put them in the California landscape. So there's all these images of ceramic vessels and sculptures out in the desert or on the beach. And there's this connection between the object itself to, to the land that I found really interesting. But you're right, there's not, there are not many people who are working even on ceramics. And then when you take it further to queer ceramics, it becomes a very lonely world very quickly. Um, which has been a, an entire thing to kind of navigate. But I, I have been very lucky to find um, allies within people who are working on queer art history. Um, sometimes I think that they think I'm kind of weird for, it's like, why are you looking at like vessels and bowls and sculptures? Like, why not like performance and these other things? And I, I think that queer ceramics in particular offer such a good lens to look at things like domesticity, to think about like, hey, what, what does it mean to make like a queer bowl? Or e even if we're moving away from the vessel tradition and going into sculpture, like what, what does it mean to do queer forms? Like clay is such a responsive medium that itself on a material level feels very queer that it, it, it becomes this great medium to think through these, these ideas and, and this lived experience. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of the kind of research that I depended upon or the scholars that I was in communication with to build my own ideas, it, it felt like I was working in two different worlds. I was working within craft history and then queer history and finding a way to blend those um, was at times a very delicate dance between the two. Um, there's a lot of overlap that exists already, but there weren't, there wasn't a lot of work being done specifically on ceramics. I feel like there's a lot of work that's been done on fibers. There's been some wonderful exhibitions, queer threads and others that looked at kind of fiber as a medium and its connection to community and, and queer culture. But it's that there's just there's so much work to be done, and I it's something that for me it's why ceramics history is so exciting, is partially because it, it is a new frontier. It's it it's been worked on historically, but the, this last the generation before me and my generation of scholars are engaging in it in new and very interesting ways that we haven't seen before the same critical level or the same use of archives that have brought in that is really putting the medium of ceramics and within queer history and elsewhere into conversation with these larger canons of art and challenging those histories in really compelling ways. And I think that's the most exciting part that you're looking at such traditional forms and looking back at these very well-known art movements and then kind of making those those compare and contrast between like the, like the AIDS crisis and then also just like the American craft movement all together. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's not something you would have read before. Um, so yeah. it's, it's great and it's kind of exciting to kind of think about those things, especially if you are an, an art historian, it's kind of the general things are taught to you in a separate, separate book. Yeah, 
And it's, it's, such, it's such a rich field, like even just within Southern California itself. So the, the two primary architects of the kind of Southern California clay movement, Laura Andresen and Glenn Lukens, UCLA and USC, they're both queer. And they're both like working in a very queer way of their with their work, starting with the surface and, and then moving into form. It's just it's not it's not written about enough. And we we need more. We need more people. We need more people digging through those archives because you're right. A lot of the times like Glenn Lucan wasn't out at all. But once you start digging around, it's it's very obvious that those mm -hmm. intimate letters um, and relationships. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for today? No. Well, before we end, I am, you were talking about allies. Oh, we do have a question. Um, Jay is asking, what do you think makes a queer bowl? There's a lot of talk of failure among ceramic artists, whether it's failure on the wheel, in the kiln, etc. Do you think failure, acceptance, a failure and perfection is a staple of queer art or ceramics? That's a very good question. Um, I think failure is a staple of ceramics, period, but I don't think it ha like necessarily has to be. And I don't I don't think that failure is is inherently queer either, or I don't think it has to be. I think there is a lot of failure that happens, but there is this pursuit and drive toward um, I, I don't want to say perfection or like success or however people are defining that for themselves, but at least the, the artists that I have worked on, um, they're not really thinking about their own work as failure. So I'll use an example of, of Rick Dillingham. So Rick Dillingham made these very beautiful vessels known as globes that are quite large that he went out and shattered them and then put them back together. So like the, the form itself becomes a, a failure to, of like, we're, we're taking this very sacred vessel tradition and, and breaking it apart and putting it back together. So he's very much rejecting this idea of both form, but perfection and, and what it's trying to be. I don't know, I don't, I don't know that failure is the most useful lens to think through how queerness operates within ceramics, because how are, how are we defining failure? and failure for whom. I think if a queer person is engaged in their practice and in their medium, and they're making an object that feels a representation of themselves and their experience, I, I don't think, I, to me, I don't care what anyone else says, that's a success to them. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be failure on, on any kind of scale. Now, perhaps if we're if we're looking at traditionally um, like queer objects from a cisgender heteronormative lens, yeah, they might view that as failure. It didn't adhere to certain so-called standards of the of the fields. But I I don't have time for those kind of hierarchies and, and questions or not questions the hierarchies and kind of stipulations of of what makes something successful for a, a group that is not part of the, the kind of queer community, the, I, I think there's many ways that queer people can express themselves. As far as like what makes a queer bowl, a queer bowl or a queer vessel, uh, that's, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's also uh, the wild west. It's, it's very open. Um, for the artists that I worked on, uh, for a lot of them, it, it came down to how they were using their materials um, that, it was in a, that the kind of effects that they could get with materials produced certain things that they were thinking through as like very bodily or queer in different ways. Um, Glenn Lukens gets very invested in these alkaline glazes that the first time he uses them there, it's a mistake or he thinks it as a mistake because they're dripping and getting all over, but he ends up embracing that as kind of this um, reflection of who he is at, and what he's trying to do. Um, but then there's like others, like Hal Riker, he's not, he's not working in the same way. And the, the, the artists across my entire book project, none of their objects necessarily look like each other. 
And it, it becomes difficult, I think, to kind of pin down what is the like aesthetics of queerness. Um, that's something that art historians, I think, have been trying to figure out for a while or have been arguing about that does queerness have a certain look or a certain kind of mode or relationship to materials. And I would argue that it really doesn't, that it's something, queerness to me, it's both a community, but it's also something that's so deeply personal and that everyone's roads and paths to queerness and to kind of coming to terms with their identity and who they are is so unique and varied that what they're going to be drawn to from a material expression form or what have you is going to be very diverse. It's, it's, it's going to be a whole spectrum of what it can look like. And, but to me, that's also part of like what the beauty of it is, is that you can have something that's imperfect or you can have something that is like, I don't know that anyone could look at Laura Andresen's porcelain vessels and say that there's anything about them that's not perfect. Like these, they they are beautiful. Like, oh, they're just, they're gorgeous. I used to work in this museum, uh, a university museum in Utah that had a very large collection of Laura Andresen. And we always would play this game of if there's an earthquake, what are the what are the objects that you take with you out of the museum? My answer was always those pots. Like they're, they, she had such mastery of both porcelain as a material, but a deep understanding on a chemical level of how glazes worked to, to a level that very few people I think have achieved. And there's very little about her work that I think you could consider a technical failure, but they're still deeply queer. So I don't know, does it feel like that's a very roundabout answer to, to your question, but it's, queer, queerness is a, a very large spectrum that I think is open to many different modes and ways of being. Okay, I found this. So, wasn't sure what that was. <laughs> Sorry, that was Siri like turned on while I was talking. I don't know why. Oh, I didn't know, and I was like, Siri, I never called on you. <laughs> I really, I really do love that idea that it's the wild west on trying to figure out what queer aesthetics looks like, because in my brain, there's just so many <laughs> groupings. Uh, but we have two more questions. One from Kim that asks, what, do you, what would you personally like to see more within the world of queer ceramics art contemporary? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, honestly, I, what I currently am seeing, I'm very happy to be seeing. I'm seeing a lot of queer artists that work in ceramics that are exploring materials in very unique ways. But I think some of the most exciting work that is coming out are queer ceramic artists um, that are black, brown, indigenous, that are exploring their own complex identities and how that expression of queerness both is parallel with more historical white expressions of queerness that we've always already seen and that are, are familiar with because that's what the canon has historically focused on, but are also radically different and bring such a, a unique, fresh, much vitally needed perspective to the medium. And it's always fun to me to be involved in curation and working with both early career and emerging artists and seeing how they're bringing their own identities to the material and how they're working through their own expressions of queerness to it that I just, I wanna see more of what I'm currently seeing um, and to continue to develop platforms for these artists to show their work and share their work. That it's, it's just, it's so important. And I think that the more we can get people seen the better the entire field will be. That as the, I, I don't know, what's the saying? All tide, tide, rising tides raise all ships. Well, that's a new one for me. I, I'd say that's correct. <laughs> but you put that in such a lovely way. And I think that answered our question that, and that I wanted to reference the introduction essay that you did for Making Between Queer Clay. Um, you talk about this collection of ceramic work portraying a language of belonging and a desire of acceptance. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you want to add on to that, but otherwise. Yeah, it's, 
I, I, what I found very interesting about the exhibition is both this kind of this language of belonging and desire of acceptance, but also that it, it was creating a material archive of those uh, of that language and how those bodies, both in the contemporary and in the past, have moved through the world and have sought out those things and what those the, the different kind of flavors and, and, and possibilities that that expression has taken on. Because the desire for acceptance, that, that means something very different to all different people, depending on their background and levels of engagement and what they're wanting from society. And I think some of the most interesting work within the exhibition and just the larger kind of um, work that I'm seeing coming out of contemporary queer craft and contemporary queer ceramics is work that speaks both on an individual level, but also doing something to heal the, the larger community or speak to a communal experience. There's several pieces within the show um, that think that are about the artist's individual experience, but also resonate, especially works that deal with um, religious trauma, that resonate with things that many queer people share in common. And through these ceramic objects, we can create both rituals and spaces for healing ourselves and each other and our community and navigate together this like very lonely road that is identity and life, um, creating connections with each other and forming that kind of community and what that looks like from a collective lens. Oh, I love that. Um, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, it's been such a lovely conversation to have. And I want to thank everyone that joined us today for this program. I also want to remind everyone that September 9th, we'll be opening two new shows. Um, we'll be opening two exhibitions, one in the vault for CJ Jellick called Systematic Erosion and our permanent collection pertaining to the Royal Bach, a German production company. We'll be opening a new exhibition called A Traveler's Guide to Metlock. Um, you. And if you're in the neighborhood, come visit the museum, of course, and we're hope hoping to see you soon, Matthew. Yes. <laughs> um, in the future, that'll be lovely. So you can actually see um, the exhibition in person and everything. So that'll be exciting. Um, and this recording for this presentation will be available at Amoka's website in the coming weeks. And thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. No, definitely. So we'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank you.